coach, we uh, want to kind of move now into a fun segment, kind of a, a rapid fire type of segment um, called start, sub or sit with you. And so um, we'll, we'll move. We've got a few of these for you here. We'll move through these and uh, we'll give you three different basketball topics, ask you to start one ask you to sub one and then ask you to sit one and then you know you can briefly explain why and then we can maybe have a discussion around it so okay. um so if you're if you're ready pat uh, i can hop in here yeah. to start okay so coach uh this first start sub or sit these are all everybody wants dunks or open threes but the reality is um you're gonna have to take contested twos from time to time so these are three different types of two point mid range type of shots. So start sub sit, which ones you'd prefer uh, and think are the most valuable. So start sub or sit the floater, uh, a step back or a jump stop and kind of like an up and under uh, searching for space. So start sub or sit those three contested two point shots. Now, my question to you is, are all these in the paint? Are these non non paint? <laughs> We're talking all paint right now. Let's go paint. paint. We'll go paint. Okay. Yeah, I you know I'm a big fan of the paint pull up. Um, I think if any time you can get to a kill spot, it's it's generally a far higher percentage shot than a lot of guys understand. Um, so I, I you know the paint pull up is deadly, but I'm going to go with floater um, as start. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sub the up and under because I think guys don't utilize fakes or know how to use fakes enough to get guys in the air. Um, and I'm going to sit the step back. Okay. So my, my, <laughs> I love that. Love that answer. I, I want to get to that. that right? I don't know if I said the start, sub, or sit correctly. Uh, you got it right. What are you teaching on the floater specifically. Um, I think you said, did you, you started that one, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the high knee first and foremost, that you got to get your knee up. Um, you got to emphasize that for, you know, I, it helps you stay on balance. It helps you stay strong in the core. Um, and I think a lot of guys drift when they don't have their, their knee up. And then there's like the, the, the argument of, you know, am I following through in my floater or is it more of an open palm? Um, and I think like, like if you, you really study the best floater finishers in the league, um, it's really the open palm versus the follow, follow through. So I think those two, you know, and it varies, you know, there's, there's certain guys that are going to teach the follow through. It's really what the player is most comfortable with. Um, but I'm more of a high knee open palm um, type floater finisher teacher than the okay. uh, finish. With, with the high knee, are you have, are you telling them to, to jump and land in the same spot? Um, no, it's, it's a little bit of, you're going to have a slight drift or a slight fall forward. Yeah. It's not a straight up and straight down. Um, but the fundamental of it is just, you're, you're falling with a strong core. You're not falling with turning your shoulders, right? Your shoulders are square to the rim and you may be drifting, you know, right or left, but ultimately your eyes are to the rim, uh, and your shoulders are square to the bucket. And so, and with the floater, are you, where do you want them to put the ball on the rim? Are you teaching like right on the front of the rim? Are you trying to swish it or where are they aiming? I guess on that floater. I'm thinking back rim, you so know, back rim. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, you tr like whenever I, I talk about finishing or watch and finishing the film session, I'm always trying to emphasize like the, the no rim makes, but I think when you're helping a guy visualize where to place the ball, like it's kind of like that backroom mentality okay. uh, because if you do miss, I feel like that's when you give your, your bigs more of an opportunity to offensive rebound, right? Mm -hmm. Getting it at the rim sometimes, like, you know, you'll see a guy, you know, maybe finish 45% on floaters, but if his placement is good and he get, he's given, you know, his bigs an opportunity to offensive rebound that there's, there's equal value. Right. For sure. Uh, so I think like, yeah, that would be my mentality there. But I, the big thing that I stress more so than the place of the ball in the rim is like where it's coming from on the floor. So we're, we're talking about like the dots, you know, like we're not settling like at the free throw line for a long float. Like, even though that may be the shot at times, but if I'm right at the dots and I'm getting to those floater kill spots, like I think that mentality 
of, oh, hey, this is like realistically where they're going to occur on the, on the court in a game and then building off of that. Okay. And coach, what changes, if anything, with a two foot takeoff for the floater? Um, it's a, a lot of rhythm. Um, I think the, the, the rhythm of your footwork is everything on your two foot, you know, whether it's a right, left step, a left, right step. Um, but really like being comfortable with like, Hey, here are the two main rhythms behind your float of footwork, you know, naturally instinctively in the game, you're going to get to either or, but let's get really comfortable with those two footwork. Okay. Footworks or feet works. I'm sorry. It's whatever you want. I don't know either. <laughs> I think Coach Messina calls it feet work, is what we've found out from uh, yes. Mike Roll. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you sat the step back. Um, and I, I guess I'm just wondering more with that being seemingly more and more popular as a, a skill that even younger and younger players are trying to learn. Um, why is that something within, you know, all of these that you would say is the least um, valuable? I think with, with the step back, it, 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 it's more reliant on like who, what your role is, you know, whereas with the floater, the step through fakes, you know, that, that's a shot. You got, if you're a skilled player, you got to be able to make those. But yeah. when you start to rep the, the step backs, those are the ones that are like the, that can be like the momentum or vibe killer for your team, depending on who's taking them. Right. So if you're repping a step back midi and you're giving no contacts, context to that, whether it's early clock or late clock, you know, sometimes a lot of guys will go out there and they'll shoot it and that's not their role. And then they'll lose trust with the coach. So I think building off of those other two before you're really repping the step back um, is something you got to be co cognizant of. Absolutely. All right, Pat. Okay, coach. Um, my start sub sit. So the most important physical attribute that goes into being an elite one-on-one -on -one defender. So start sub or sit footwork or feet work, uh, <laughs> working with your hands or physicality. And a perimeter, perimeter, uh, one-on-one -on -one defender. Well, I'm going to start with physicality because I think I'll start physicality because with physicality comes pride. And in order to be a great individual defender, you've got to be prideful, right? So I think physicality is the number one. Um, footwork, I'd say, man, this is a tough one between footwork and length, right? Like, cause if you're long, you know, I'll, probably say like let's sub the length because you know we can then go down the road and, and try to hammer away and teach the footwork um so let me let me go with sub sub length and then man i may i might sound a little bit backwards but then we'll sit we'll sit footwork um <laughs> but i think the pride factor and the length factor you know those two things like um you got those you know and maybe we've got the development more so to develop you into a better defender than if you didn't have either of those mm -hmm. And with kind of the length or the handwork, are you stressing anything, whether to kind of dig with what hand to dig or to pressure the dribble or is there anything or just use your length, be active, be wide? Yeah, it's, it's the early high hand concept. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm chesting a drive, you know, one, I gotta, I gotta have early high hands to, to not my, put myself in a position to uh, become foul prone, you know, like with all the, the techniques of foul drawing at the NBA level, you know, if you're not using your, your length and chesting drives and showing hands, um, you're going to send a guy to free throw line. So um, on the ball, like that's, you know, being early with your hand, showing your length early, chesting drives early. Like I think that's the, the first and foremost uh, way to teaching length and being effective with using your length. Um, you know, off the ball, different case, but just being long and gaps early. But yeah. uh, on the ball, showing your length early. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to impact and impact the vision of the handler. Co Coach, quickly on the footwork or feet work, we'll figure it out by the time. Um, <laughs> how much in the NBA are they trying to stay in a stance and slide rather than get out of the stance, turn to run and beat guys to spots as an on-ball defender? Um, I think you, you see... It, you know, it's, it's, it's a process of we're teaching technique, but at the end of the day, if you, you, you got to run and, and beat a guy to a spot, like it's, it's really your judgment to, to feel as if what's comfortable for you. Yeah. Um, I think defensively, like, you know, you're, you're going to have to read and react and understand like, 
this is when I'm out of the play and I've got to resort to the habit of sprinting to get in front, or I'm going to say, stay sound and, and really move my feet. Um, but ultimately it's like someone's technique, it, it, you know, it's going to vary player to player. You know, you're going to have your fundamentals behind it, but there's some guys that can just excel with, you know, being able to cut corners because they are that athletic, but it's ultimately reminding that player to, Hey, if we're, we're fundamental in doing so and sticking to the script with, with our technique, like skipping those steps may become a little bit more easy because you are fundamentally sound. Absolutely. Coach, next start subset for you. Let's go. Um, <laughs> these are, these are three man actions that you can run offensively. Um, sort of flowing out of transition. Okay. So start sub or sit pistol action, split or delay action, you know, throw it to a post and get some sort of split cut action uh, or going into a double drag where the guard or the wing is either the first or second screener. It can pop or you can play out of it. So start sub sit those three, three man actions. I'm going to start pistol. Um, I, I'm a huge proponent of the action. I just think like it, it helps teach a pitch ahead mentality and understand that there is a purpose uh, for running ahead of the ball. You know, sometimes guys, they think it's a chore, but it's, Hey, if you, if you get ahead of the ball early and you're able to touch corner and snap back and get in that catch position, like you're in a position to make a play. Um, and I think there's just so much creativity and, and re react concepts that you can work out of it. And then I'm going to sub delay uh, or splits so forth. Um, I think with delay, you got to be really careful with if you, if you don't treat it as a lifestyle, this is the same thing with pistol. If you don't treat it as a lifestyle where it's second nature and you're really trusting it and, and trusting your off ball movement, it just becomes static and super scoutable. And I, I really like the action if it's, if it's embraced the right way. Um, but if it's not embraced the right way, it can just become a cluster and just a, a lack of purpose to it. The double drag, it's tough to, it's tough to, uh, to sit, um, you know, great quick hitting action. But I think the more that you can become a little bit less on ball oriented um, and versatile and playing off to on the ball, uh, you know, you give your offense a little bit more versatility and selflessness to it because a double drag can resort into a uh, or result in a zero pass possession a lot of the times, right? For um, sure. Yeah. I think the, the pistol delay and double drag in that order. Okay. Coach, you, you talked about if you don't embrace the split or delay, it can get bogged down and, and not run well. Um, is that when you've seen that happen, is that because guys don't cut hard or they don't understand the reads out of it? I mean, how does the split get bogged down and easy to guard in your mind? Yeah, I think it's get, it gets treated more as a set than a flow. Uh, I think both of those actions, uh, they're not sets. They're, like I said, they're flows, they're lifestyles. It's, you know, if you, if you can't get your guys to understand that this is, this is what we, we're not going to put constraints on you. We want you to be in these spots and we want you to hoop. Like that's when the action doesn't become what it should be. But when that mentality is mastered behind it, I mean, you've seen with D'Antoni and how he's implemented it throughout his entire career. You know, it's beautiful, you know, in Phoenix, um, with Nash, you know, that was, that was a lifestyle right there. And so, you know, if you're not able uh, to implement it um, that way, that's when it starts to get stagnant. All okay, right. Bring us home. Yeah. I'll bring a, a quick one, kind of a fun one coach. I thought of the most overrated individual ex improvement accessory uh, as you can have overrated cones, the like soft sticks, or the dummies that just, you know, the stationary dummies hands up most overrated for skill development. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of the, the dummies. <laughs> they're, they're pretty much glorified cones. You know, I'm not a fan of cones either way. It's bones over cones all day. Shout out Cody Topper. For that, uh, <laughs> but, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, so I'm going to sit the, uh, the, uh, life size cone. Um, yeah. I'm going to sub the cones because I just think like at some level, like that's, that's the root, you know, there's a root of the game to it, right? Like as a kid, you're going out outside, you're putting the cones on the floor, you know, at your outdoor court, you're doing handling drills. Like, I mean, that's how we've grown up. Um, so in a way, like just trashing the cone altogether isn't great. I think at some level it's needed. Um, but when you get higher up, you know, it's all about the pads, baby. You know, for me, <laughs> uh, it helps me be my, uh, you know, go bear. 
You know, I got Gobert length and I can get in there. I can block a, sh- a shot. I can talk some crap and, um, <laughs> You know, just uh, challenge a guy at the rim, even though I may be 7'11". <laughs> That's good. You know, it's, uh, it's a good tool. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, the hand pads. I think you can move with them in a realistic way, and it, it helps short guys like myself, you know, really yeah. challenge. So. Coach, if if, uh, if we were to have thrown, uh, like, tennis balls in there, where, yeah. would, where, where would they be in the lineup? Um. I'd probably say sub. I okay. think do some creative handling stuff with it, just hand-eye coordination. Cool. Uh, but it's really, to me, it's more of a warm-up just to get that neuromuscular coordination sure. right. And, but, you know, Steve Nash and, and at Santa Clara, the, I guess the legend held it that he used to dribble a tennis ball all through campus. You know? Okay. So it's like, you know, it's another way to be creative and test your neuromuscular coordination. <laughs>